We are in our third week in a series in the book of James. And so if you have your guide, go ahead and pull out your guide. That'll be helpful for you this morning. And the tagline is becoming a distinctive community. And so we're looking at James. James is this disciple of Jesus. Uh, he was uh, the half-brother of Jesus. And he's writing this letter, and it's addressed to the 12 tribes in the diaspora. So these, these 12 scattered tribes of Israel scattered out through beyond Palestine. And, so, and then after that, uh, the letter kind of proceeds much more like, like Jewish wisdom literature. And we talked a little bit about that the first week. Um, about how to read James, because it is a little different than like one of Paul's epistles would be. Paul's epistles sometimes are very specific to a specific community. They're addressing specific issues, and you can kind of hear in the letter what's going on in the church that Paul's addressing. You can kind of hear, oh, this, this, this issue is being addressed, or they're, they're having this kind of heretical teaching or false teaching or whatever's, whatever's going on. But in James, it's written differently, and it's written like, like Jewish wisdom literature, which is uh, wisdom being how to live well, how to live your life in a way that's wise, how to live your life in a way that acknowledges God and, and brings out good, good, good results in your life. And so when we think of wisdom literature in the, in the Bible, a lot of times we think of like the book of Proverbs. And if you read the book of Proverbs, that's what it is. It's a father talking to his son saying, son, if you want to, if you want to live a good life, let me teach you a couple things. Let me teach you a, a couple things that you need to know about how you talk and about how you act and how you interact in romantic relationships and how you parent your kids. And, and so there's all that stuff when we think about Proverbs. Um, and and you, in James, you'll see quotations from Proverbs, but even the parts that aren't quotes, you kind of go, yeah, that sounds kind of like Proverbs, right? Um, or, or like the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount sounds a lot like James. And it's, 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 it goes from one subject to another to another. And it doesn't seem like sometimes it's all connected, you know, but, but it's, 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 this is how... You should live your life before God. And so that's where we're at in James. And we're kind of looking at it through that lens of wisdom literature, recognizing what it is, but also looking at it through the lens of a communal reading, right? If, this, if these letters were kind of dispersed and passed around from community to community and church to church, they would have been read publicly to the community. And, and really what he's trying to, he's, he's showing us how to shape a Christian community. As followers of Jesus, what should this community of faith look like? What should, our, what should our values be? What should be the things that make us distinctive? Because as Jewish Christians, they would have known what those things are and, and, and how, we, how we stand out from the community around us. But now as, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, what does this look like? And so that's kind of where we're at in this series, is we're talking about what does it mean to be a distinctive, a distinctive community? And so James is offering wisdom for these Christians, for countercultural living in their culture that they live in. So the first week we talked about a community of wholehearted devotion to God in the midst of a world of lukewarm faith and kind of talked about how, how the, our dominant culture, the culture we live in, the waters we swim in, Rick always says, how, how that, um, for their understanding of faith, understanding of, of religion, understanding of, of this part of your life can be very compartmentalized. That it's okay if you have your spirituality, but that's just a piece of who you are. It's, it doesn't need to be all important. And when we look at scripture, that's really not, that really doesn't line up, is, is we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, all our strength. And so James is calling uh, people to, to wholehearted devotion to God. He says, if you're, if you're a friend of the world, then, then that means you're, you're an enemy of God in some way. And we talked about what that means and what that looks like. The second week, we talked about a community committed to obedience to God's law of freedom in a world of autonomous freedom and talked about the difference in the way that we as believers view freedom. We value freedom. We love freedom. We, we sing about freedom, how God has set us free. But when we say freedom, we don't just mean we do whatever we want, but freedom, true freedom is living under the law of God, walking in the ways of God. And again, that just lines up with wisdom literature. If you want to live a life that's healthy, if you want to live a life that's good, to follow the ways of, of the Lord. And then today, our title will be a community that lives trusting God's sovereign purpose in a world of practical atheism. That's a lot of words, um, but we'll talk about what they mean in just a minute. So if you want to grab your Bible, um, James chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. James chapter 4. i got to find it too. Page number 1013. What's really awesome is I didn't intentionally do this, but 
I ended up getting a Bible that has the same page numbers as the chair Bibles. That's really helpful. Um, so that's, that's awesome. But if you, if you don't have a Bible this morning, there's a Bible under every other chair. Um, so if you're looking for a Bible, grab one. You're going to need that. Um, the scripture won't be on the screen this morning, so you need a Bible in front of you, and we'll refer back to it quite a bit. If you don't have a paper Bible of your own, if you don't own a paper hard copy of God's Word uh, that doesn't need to be charged, um, we have one across the, across the courtyard in the info center. We'd love to give you a Bible this morning. Um, I really like my Bibles on screens. That's just my own personal thing. But every once in a while, a battery dies, and it's nice to have a paper one, right? Um, Because then you can get into it. So let's stand this morning for the reading of God's Word. And we're going to be in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. All right, 13 through 17. It says this. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there, and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we just pause to recognize again that you're among us. That these moments that we gather around your word, that we gather around your table together, uh, that you're here. So we invite you today to awaken our hearts, to open our eyes, to open our ears, to hear what you have to say to us, who you're calling us to be as a people and as individuals today. God, I pray that your word would be clear. I pray that the gospel would be clear and um, that you would have your way among us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, go NFC. <laughs> Guys, we're going to lose. It's, not, it's, it's the Pro Bowl. Nobody even cares, right? Like, I'm not saying that. I don't, I don't care. It's, it's like the fake game of the year that we all get to watch today. Um, and some of you are like, I don't even know what he's talking about. Today is the Pro Bowl. Um, if, you're, if you're not a football person, um, it's, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, it sounds important, but it really doesn't matter at all. It's a bunch of players that just kind of like bump into each other a little bit and make lots of points. And we lose. That's how it ends. We lose. Uh, NFC always loses. So um, how many of you this morning, you would, you would confess to being a planner, like you're a person, you have a calendar and your life, the calendar is the, is the king. How many of you would, you confess you're those kinds of, of people, all right? All right, how many of you are, your paper calendar people? I have to have it on paper. I have to write it down with a pen. I have to cross it off when I'm done. All right, any digital calendar people? You like the little bing, bing? How many of you are both? Both, all right, good. It's hard to do both. You have to pick one or the other, don't you? You're like a two double-minded man tossed by the waves, all right? I don't know how that works. Um, yeah, I mean, and don't calendars make us feel important? Like they make us, I love, we, we, I love the little thing on Google, so I'm all digital kind of a guy, right? I like to put everything in my calendar with my thumbs and, and I read books on screens and I'm, that's just the world I live in. Um, but I love waking up in the morning going, hey Google, what's on my schedule today? And Google will read off like, today you have three appointments, blah, 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 blah. And I feel like, yeah, look at me, I got appointments, you know? And it's like, it's this thing where like the, 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 the you from the past tells the you from today what to do, and then I get to tell my future me what he has to do, right? That's kind of how calendars work. And so we get, sometimes I get to a day and I go, what was the former me thinking when he planned this day? Have you ever had that moment? Where you get, you go like, this looked good on paper, this looked good on my calendar, but I, now that I'm here, like, this isn't gonna work. I'm going to be exhausted. Or, or, hey, I don't have, you know, I have to drive for 30 minutes to get from here to here. That's, that's not going to work. Um, but some of you are more veteran planners than I, and you never have those moments. I, but I, I do. Um, how many of you aren't planners? You're like, yeah, I'm, I'm go with the flow. I'm a, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, good. See, I've kind of had that progression in my life. I don't think that I'm a planner by nature, okay? This is not something that I naturally do. Um, I like playing with my screens, so that's like the fun of putting it in a digital calendar. Um, but when we first got married, Chris and I, we decided one week to just, just to take a vacation. Like, 
And in my mind, like, spontaneity is fun, right? It sounds fun. Like, let's just go somewhere. We'll find some place to stay and we'll find something to do and it'll be fun. That's not the way it works, though, in real life, right? I mean, most of us that have taken a vacation, maybe some of you are, are spontaneous people like that, but, but I remember we were driving around town trying to find a hotel, and when, town, when all the hotels are full, that's not fun. That's, it's not fun. And I have memories even of, of when I was a kid, we did the, kind of the similar thing. So I don't know how I didn't learn my lesson then to then, um, but I remember we just, one year for, for her birthday, we just decided we're just going to go to Disneyland. Right? And we just jumped in the car. We drove to Disneyland like it. I think we left at like three in the morning to get there when it opened, right? Because we're young and we can do that. And so we, we showed up and we, we bought our tickets and we played in the park and found a hotel somehow on, a, on our phone or something. And, and it was actually really fun. It was just a spontaneous kind of thing. But then we had kids, <laughs> right? And with kids, I, at, by that point in our life, I had learned you have to make a plan, right? I can't just show up and drive around the car with, with three kids. I think we had three at this point. And we can't just drive around with three kids in the car and try to find a hotel. That's not going to work. So, so we booked a hotel. We planned our days. We had a kind of an itinerary laid out. But I planned our itinerary the way that we would have done it with just the two of us. So like for us, if we're going to Disneyland, if you're paying for a ticket, I'm going to get every minute I can out of that ticket, right? I'm gonna show up right when the park opens. I'm gonna like, they're, they're, I'm pushing people out of the way just to get through the door first. And then we're gonna stay there until the fireworks go off and all the lights turn off and then we can go home. That's the way we do Disneyland, right? That's, that's the right way to do it. But we decided to take our three young children. And I think the youngest Gibson was probably two years old or something. We were pushing him around in a stroller waiting in lines with a stroller, that's always fun. And then we had, uh, Evan was probably five, seven, seven and Caleb was probably five-ish, right? Somewhere around there. So little kids, young kids, and we go and make our Disneyland trip. And so uh, the first day we get there right as the park opens and I'm ready to party all day. Like, guys, we're gonna have fun. It's gonna be great, we're gonna do these rides. And we got right around, like right after lunchtime, um, things started to kind of unravel. Uh, <laughs> The kids start screaming, there was crying. I remember being on the Dumbo ride and someone saying, I hate this, those kinds of things. Like, I made my children hate the happiest place on earth because of my poor planning, all right? And so in the middle of the day, we have to take the kids back to the hotel and put them in bed and let them take a nap because they're done. They're just, they're out of their minds. And I'm sitting there watching the clock tick by going, we paid money for this. We paid money for this. And you, you just shouldn't take kids that young. It was, it was not a good idea. Um, but but I, I've learned over my life, right? The, first of all, the importance of planning. Like I've learned that if you, if you make a plan, life goes better for the most part, right? But I think the other thing that we learn as we, as we get older and as we have some life experiences is how contingent our plans can be. Like how quick my plans can change when things don't go the way I want them to go. And sometimes those are funny stories. Sometimes those are funny stories about kids hating the Dumbo ride and all that stuff. And uh, we left that night, and I remember asking the kids, did you guys have fun today? And they went, no. <laughs> That's horrible, right? I mean, I, like, I'm a terrible dad. And so, and, and did, what was your favorite part? Nothing, you know, and it was just not good. And so the, I, the last question was, well, should we come back tomorrow? And they kind of looked up and went, that was my only win of the day. All right, well, at least we can try again tomorrow. Um, but you learn over time that, that plans are important, that making plans matters, but also that plans, uh, you know, they can kind of change pretty quick. And sometimes those are, those are funny. Sometimes those are like the heartbreaking moments of our lives, right? Sometimes those are the moments that, that someone passes away unexpectedly. Sometimes those are the moments that we get bad news on, on, on some medical front or we find out um, those kinds of things. And, and it's funny how quick... All of our plans that seem so concrete and so well laid can kind of just go out the window. Like, well, that doesn't matter anymore, and this is what we have to do right now. And um, and so this morning we're we're gonna we're reading this text, and it's it's this it's this kind of hypothetical situation. And throughout James, James is mostly addressing this book to to brothers. He calls them brothers a lot. He's talking to fellow Christians, and he's saying, "Brothers, I want to I want to help you. I want to encourage you. I want to teach you." But he gets to this part, and then the beginning of chapter 5, there's two spots where he says, Come now, you who say. Come now, you, this, this group of people. So he's addressing a group of people, 
we can kind of tell from the context that he's still addressing Christians, but he's addressing a certain, a certain type of person. And he, he illustrates it by telling this, this little hypothetical scenario, right? Come now you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town, spend a year there, trade and make a profit. And so we have these businessmen, right, that are making a plan to go do business somewhere. They're planners. They're, they're, they're kind of contingent planners because they're saying today or tomorrow or such and such a place or whatever. But, but they're, they're these, and probably well off people, if they were able to make travel plans like that and just kind of go, yeah, we're going to go live here for a year. We're going to do business here for a year and just kind of spring up a business. These are, these are kind of experienced entrepreneurs, right? But it's hypothetical. He's not addressing a specific person. He's just saying, you who say things like this, people who talk like this, if you say, I'm going to go here, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to make money, I have something I need to say to you. And we kind of read that, and I don't know about you, when I read that, I go like, what's, what's so wrong with that? Like, is it, is it bad to make a plan? That doesn't seem, is it bad to make money? That doesn't, that doesn't seem right either. So what are they doing that's so wrong? And the Bible has a lot to say about planning. Um, and I'm going to just throw up a bunch of scriptures here for a second, just kind of talk through them. Um, but Proverbs has a lot to say about planning, right? Because it's, it's a piece, of, it's a piece of, uh, of wise living, really. And the Proverbs 21.5 says, The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Proverbs 16.3, Come, commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. So the Scripture isn't saying planning is bad. Don't, don't make plans, just wait and see what happens. Like, that's not what he's saying. We read the Proverbs and it's saying, no, making plans is good, okay? Dave, don't just jump in a car and try to go do something. That's not a good idea. Um, Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. The next one there, Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And so those first two are kind of saying, yeah, planning is good. You need to make a plan. But the second two are kind of reminding us, men can make plans, but God is sovereign over all of that. That God gets to determine his steps. That, that is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Psalm 90, this is the Psalm of Moses. He says, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. So there's wisdom in understanding that our lives are short. That in our planning to understand that, that, that this life is temporary, there's wisdom in that. Proverbs 3, 6, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. And many of us have that one memorized, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll make your paths straight. And again, those are, those are wisdom literature again um, and when we're looking at the Proverbs. And so how many of you have ever, you've ever committed your way to the Lord and it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to? Has anybody ever done that? But yeah, Proverbs says, commit your ways to the Lord. It's, it's going to work out, right? That's kind of what Proverbs is saying. And that's, again, when we look at wisdom literature, this is how we have to read it, is these are things that are generally true. If you don't commit your way to the Lord, things aren't going to go well. If you do, generally speaking, life will be better for you. But that doesn't mean it's a foolproof promise of every time you commit. If I just say the magic word and say, God, I commit this to you, then it'll do what I want it to do. If any of us have followed the Lord for any length of time, we know that's not the way it works, Right? Because God's purposes stand. Because God is sovereign. And, and sometimes questions beyond what we can answer, um, we look at our lives and we go, God, I don't understand what you were doing there, but I just have to trust that, that you know what you're doing. And so the problem here isn't that they're making a plan. The problem here isn't that they're making money. Even though the Bible gives us warnings about wealth and, and the dangers of, of, of wealth and how we need to guard ourselves and all that, that's really not what this passage is about. That's what James 5 is about. That one's coming. Um, but what this one is about, he kind of makes clear next. He says, yet you do not know, verse 14, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. So he's kind of reminding them of, of, of some of those scriptures we just read, that your life, I brought this this morning to keep you awake, just in case. There's a jet setting, so I can, I'm just kidding. Um, but also this, that, that he says your life is like, is like a mist. It's there for a minute, and then it vanishes, right? 
Did you miss it? Can I do it again? <laughs> that. A mist that vanishes. And we laugh, but like, what he's saying is like, this is your life. You think it's so important. I wake up in the morning, I feel really important when I say, hey, Google, what do, what do I got to do today? And he says, oh, you have five appointments. Psh. Yeah, but it's a mist. It's going to be gone in a minute. And we serve a God that is eternal. We serve a God that is, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We were just singing those things, that our God is great. And we can't even fathom, as people who live like this, what, what eternal God looks like. We can't, we can't even fathom the enormity and, and the... The, the strength, the greatness of a God, that his word stands. But that's what, that's what James is kind of reminding them of. But then he gets into the part, we really start to see what the problem is in verse 16. He says, you boast in your arrogance. Read it with me. It says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. But again, when we read that, we probably don't see like arrogance, do we? We don't read that and go, man, that guy's really arrogant. He's going to go so-and-so and make money. Like, that doesn't sound like arrogance, but, but James is, is really talking about this attitude, this worldview behind the way that they're making their plans. That you think that you determine what will happen for the next year. That do you really believe that what I say and what I plan, that I can control life even for the next year, even for the next day? He says, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. And he's not saying, then stop making plans and stop talking and don't ever, you know. No, it's not that. It's, it's look at the heart behind your planning. And he even goes so far as to say, all such boasting is evil. He offers us kind of a, an alternative. And um, this is kind of a phrase you may, be, you may be familiar with, you may have heard people say, is that instead you should say, if the Lord wills, Right? And so we could just kind of take that and go, okay, well, this means then we just need to start saying Lord willing for everything. And some people do. Um, and that's not, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think there's a, he's, he's definitely addressing the way that we talk, that the way that we speak matters, that the way that we talk about our future matters. Um, but I think it's even deeper than that. He's addressing a heart issue. He's addressing arrogance and pride in the way that we think about the future. And so today what we want to do is kind of look at that as a community that lives trusting God's sovereign purpose in a world of practical atheism. Um, what I want us to realize is that we live in a world uh, that talks like this all the time. That's why this isn't striking to us. It's not like, wow, you shouldn't, you shouldn't talk that way. Um, we live in a world that, that practically um, lives out their lives as if God isn't listening, as if God isn't in control. And um, I really love... I love numbers, I love statistics, and so this, this week I went online and kind of looked up um, some statistics from the uh, Pew Research Center, which a lot of times will research different uh, religious demographics, all kinds of stuff, and I, a nerd like me can get lost on a website like that, because um, I just like statistics and stuff, and so if you don't like this, just bear with me, but according to 2014 Pew Research Study, um, just in Arizona, so you can even like click your state. Oh my gosh, it's fun. And so 90% of Arizonans, 90% of the people that you live around, believe in God or some form of higher power. How many of you would guess that? Like 90%? Yeah, we're probably 90% or so. Maybe, maybe not. Over half the population claims belief in the God of the Bible. Two-thirds of people report attending religious services at least monthly. 67% of Arizona claim to be Christians, and 60% believe that the Bible is the word of God. All right? That's the community we live in. That's what they say they believe. And James is a book that's written going, I don't care about all that stuff, right? He's saying, I want to see in your life how it affects what you do, how it affects how you act. And I don't know about you, when I think about just the community we live in, if 90% of people believe in God, if that many people believe in the Bible, how many of you feel like maybe that isn't always reflected in the way that we live? Right? I mean, because for the most part, we, we, I don't hear people on the news talking about God's will as we're, as we're trying to, to make decisions as a country. I don't, I don't hear people um, saying things like that, saying, Lord willing, I'm going to go do this, or, 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 or recognizing God in our everyday lives. And so we live in a world that says one thing, that's, and, and it's, it's, it's a danger for us as believers to recognize that, that we live in a society that says as long as you think the right things, then you're good. 
Like our, our version of Christianity in America often says, as long as you believe, and by believe, we just kind of go, yeah, it's in here, it's internal. As long as I have that right, I'm good. And James is going, no, the words you say matter. Your actions matter. You say you have faith, show me your faith by what you do. Where in your life can I see your faith? That's like, that's the message of the book of James, right? He keeps saying, yes, you say you believe, but, but what, does that, what does that do? What does it look like in your life? And so we live in a dominant culture, uh, again, that says, that says, keep your religion in bounds. That, that religion is just a little piece of your life. That your, your faith is just a small part of who you are. And it's, it's practical atheism or, or functional atheism. And so as a community of faith, James is calling us then to something uh, beyond that, to, to where, where when we think about the future, when we talk about the future, when we plan for the future, that we're acknowledging God in our plans. Um, and practical atheism, when we look at it, he, and the way James talks about it, uh, the root of it is pride. He says it's arrogance, and, and that your words are betraying your arrogance, that the, these things that you're saying are arrogant. And it's, it's the pride, this, this arrogance, this non-acknowledgement of God is really the root of sin, right? The pride is the root of it. It's, it's the way that sin entered the world. When we think about uh, the story of the Bible, that God creates a good world. Adam and Eve are, are enjoying life. They knew God. They believed in God, obviously. They walked with God. He created them. He knew them. But yet, in the moment of sin, God says, don't eat this thing, Right? And it says that they looked at it and they saw that it was, that it was good to eat. That I, I look at this and I go, yeah, I know God said that. I know God said, I'm supposed to, I'm not supposed to. But I look at this and I go, yeah, it looks okay to me. I'm going to give it a shot. That's practical atheism. And it's not, that, it's not that they don't believe. It's not that the internal wasn't right. It was that the external wasn't lined up with their internal. And the same thing with us today. I think uh, when I think about practical atheism and, and, and the way that we live our lives, those, those plans we make, the biggest plans of our lives, the biggest decisions of our lives, uh, the way that we spend our money, the way that we spend our time, the way that we parent our kids, um, as, how have we invited God into those moments in our lives? When we're getting ready to, to buy a new car, do we sit down and go, God, what would you have me do? With, with this. When we're thinking about where we're going to live, do we just, I mean, I think for most of us, we go online, we research stuff, we read reviews, we trust our own, our own abilities, we trust our own thinking, uh, we, we lean on our own understanding. It sounds different when I say it that way, doesn't it? Because that doesn't seem like a bad thing. Of course I'm going to read reviews. That's what Amazon's for, you know? Like, <laughs> I want to see what's good. But, but, but where, where does that come into the wisdom of God in the way that we live our lives? Do we lean on our own understanding or do we acknowledge him in all our ways? And what does that look like? One of the things that we talk about around here is, is blessed rhythms. There's a, there's a little card on the, on the racks out there as you leave. Um, that said blessed to be a blessing or something about blessing on it. It's, it's blessy language. Um, but but it's, these, it's these practices that we as a church, many of us at VIA practice these things. And it's an acronym that talks about, about blessing. And what it is, it's ways for us to live out our faith in practical ways. And one of them, the, there's bless, listen, eat, speak, and Sabbath. Those are kind of the five practices. And I, I don't have time to talk about all of them. Um, but that, that fourth one, that S that says speak, um, reminds us that what we say matters. And a lot of times if, if, when we talk about blessed rhythms in different small groups I've been a part of, we'll talk about, about how are your blessed rhythms going. And, and a lot of the conversation about, about speaking is how often does Jesus come up in conversation? If we're going to talk about the words, if we're going to talk about this conversation, how often does Jesus just come up? Is that weird for me to bring Jesus up into a conversation? Because if my life is, is his, if he's the Lord of my life, if he's my Lord and Savior, if, if we're a community that's being shaped by this story, it shouldn't, it shouldn't Jesus come up every once in a while. 
But often he doesn't, right? I think, and I'm not just trying to make you feel guilty, but, but it's something we need to think about is what are the words coming out of our mouths? The plans we make, the things we buy, the way we spend our time, the way that we budget our money. Are we acknowledging God in those areas of our lives? With our kids, I can read, uh, there are so many parenting blogs and books and people posting things on Facebook and studies and, and all this stuff. And I can get lost in that. But do I acknowledge God in my parenting? Do I say, God, how can I, man, this kid's driving me nuts. How can, can you help me? How can I better parent this guy? Those are the things I think James is calling us to think about. A community that trusts God's sovereign purpose. I think about a few people in scripture. Um, we talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing before the king just a minute ago. And saying, whether he, whether, whether he saves us or whether he doesn't, we're going to serve him. I think about Job in some of the, the, the most dire situation of his life saying, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. When we talk about trusting God's sovereignty, I, I recognize this is not always like an easy thing to do. Sometimes these are the hardest moments of our lives. Sometimes these are the moments where we go, I can't understand why a God who loves me and cares about me and is good would allow this to happen. That's a reality of of a life of faith, right? But Job responds as a righteous man, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And not that he understood it, not that he was going, yeah, this, this makes sense. Yeah, everything I have is dead or gone or burned or, you know, demolished. If you know the story, it's horrible. But still sitting in, in ashes going, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. I think of the life of the Apostle Paul. If you read Paul's journeys in the book of Acts and the way that he talks about God's will is really cool to me because he'll go someplace and they just can't, it's not working out. They can't get there. They can't. It, and he says, the Lord closed the door and the Lord called us to here and, and we went where the Lord called us. And, and there's, just this, there's just this trust that even when things are falling apart, even when it seems like you're going off the rails, Paul, he's going, yeah, God closed that door. <laughs> I'm like, what? It's, but it's, it's a life of faith. It's acknowledging that God is still sovereign. That God didn't just like forget one day, oh, Dave's still around and he needs, he needs some help. But even in the most heartbreaking, un, unanswerable moments of my life, that I can trust God's sovereignty. I can trust his will and acknowledge him. Um, we started with a, with a song this morning, It Is Well With My Soul. And, um, and that's another one of those prayers, It Is Well, It Is Well. So it starts out, when peace like a river attendeth my way, right? Or when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul. And part of that is the story that we live into. That fourth verse, I don't think we sang it this morning, but I'll tell you it anyways, because it's good. Uh, The fourth verse says this, Lord, haste the day, right? When my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound. The Lord will descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. I love the way he wraps that up, because I think what he's saying is, is this isn't just a prayer of of like denial. Like, oh yeah, that's... Peace like a river, sorrows like sea billows, whatever, I'm good. It's not a flippant prayer. This is a prayer that recognizes that I'm living as into a bigger story, that my life is this, right? It's a mist. But that one day there's a day coming when the clouds will be rolled back as a scroll. The trump will resound. The Lord will descend. And because of that, even though, even so, it is well with my soul. And in just a minute, we're going to gather around these tables And these tables are a reminder of that for us. These tables are a look back to the work, to the death of Jesus. And and when we eat this bread, when we drink this cup, what we're saying is we're proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes, right? That's a piece of it. Remembering that our life is found in in the saving work of Jesus, that he gave his life for us. But then we're also looking forward to this day that we're gonna gather around a table together. And it's funny when I start to start to just look at Jesus, when I start to just remember Jesus, isn't it amazing how the things, there's an old song that says, the things of earth will go strangely dim. Isn't it? And sometimes at this table, that's what starts to happen is that we go, 
it is well with my soul because I know who I'm believing in. I know where I'm going. I know who he is, and I trust him today. The good news of the gospel is that God saves arrogant, terrible, non-acknowledging sinners. That God saves the worst. This morning, the bad news is that your sin is worse than you think it is. (laughs) That's the bad news. The bad news is that you're arrogant when you don't even realize you're arrogant. When I read that, it's convicting for me because I go, how many times then am I just thumbing my nose at God and saying, God, I'm going to do what I want to do? How many times in a week do I live as a practical atheist? Lord, help us. I mean, that's what, we're going to confess those sins together around these tables today and say, God, forgive us. But the good news of the gospel is that the grace of Jesus is enough. The good news of the gospel is that because of the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus, that we can have freedom from sin, that we can be forgiven, that God can look at all of that and see the righteousness of Christ because of the work of Jesus. And so this morning, as we're, as we're talking about all of this, if you don't know the Lord this morning, um, you're not going to be able to do this on your own. You can't. As Christians today, we recognize we're dependent on the Spirit of God to lead us. If I'm going to have faith like that, to trust that God's sovereign purpose is still at work in my life, even when things look horrible, it's going to be a work of the Spirit within me. And it's all because of the, 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 the sacrifice of Christ, this life we have in him. So if you would this morning, we're going to come to the table in a minute, but can we bow our heads for just a sec? And um, can we take a moment just to maybe confess our sin to the Lord today? And maybe you have a big decision happening right now that you go, man, I haven't even thought about inviting the Lord into that. And you want to say just for a minute, just God, forgive me for, for just carrying on as if you're not even here. Maybe you have a really tough situation and you're just having trouble trusting and believing that God is still in control this morning. And James is calling us to say, trust God. Trust that he's still at work. Trust that he's sovereign, even in that area. It doesn't mean that you're going to have an answer. It doesn't mean that you're going to understand. But to say, God, I'm I'm going to trust in you. Even when I can't figure it out, even when I can't understand, God, forgive me. Lord, we confess our sins to you today knowing that you hear us, knowing that you forgive us because of the blood of Jesus. We humbly confess our arrogance in failing to acknowledge your power, your presence, your purpose in our lives. Father, may our attitudes and the words that flow from our attitudes, our plans for the future, God, may they reflect our faith in you, a God that is sovereign, and a willingness to joyfully and humbly submit to your will today.